It's an honor to get to stand before you and preach God's word that is relevant, that is current. It applies today, just as it did 2,000 years ago. We need it still today. It's what we build our life from. And so my wife and I, we were uh, we were shopping yesterday. We went to Hobby Lobby on a Saturday during holiday season. We made it, thank God. We made it out alive. <laughs> yeah. we, were, we were standing in line. And uh, the woman who was in front of us, she, her cart was just full. It was just full of items. And um, I remember as she's putting everything on the counter, and the cashier's ringing it up, just item after item after item. She finally goes, oh, and now here's what we actually came for. Here's the reason that I showed up in the first place. And when she said that, it just it gave me a picture, knowing that I was coming here today, getting to speak to y'all. And I grew up in church, so I've heard a lot of the church phrases, a lot of the church sayings that sometimes we just say, we don't even realize what we're saying, they just sound good. Cute alliterations and axioms. And I remember a saying, it's, you know, you gotta expect it. You'll only experience it if you expect it. I don't know if that's true, because I feel like and I believe that we serve a God who exceeds our expectations. And so just like that woman, when she was like, after everything else, oh, here's what I came for. I believe that God is saying, you came here for peace today, but I'm also going to give you hope. You came here for hope today, but I'm also going to give you confidence. I'm going to give you more than enough, because that's the type of God that I am. I'm more than enough. So how many are ready to receive today from a God who chased you down? Some of you, you wouldn't even be here today if it wasn't for the love of God that chased you down. So I want to read from uh, Judges. I'm going to set up this sermon for you. I want to talk about Samson today. I want to use Samson as a character in Judges chapter 16. But I want to use Samson and then I also want to tell you a story of a couple that my wife and I were very close to. And I believe that the two stories, the two journeys will parallel. And God's going to reveal something to you today that you're going to need, that you're going to take out of this place. You're going to walk on his word. You're going to walk on his truth. You're going to walk on his promises today. And so in Judges, Judges chapter 16, verse 25, it says, Why they were in high spirits, they shouted, Look at your neighbor say, who is they? Who is they? They is the Philistines. The Philistines. They shouted, bring out Samson to entertain us. So they called Samson out of the prison and he performed for them. When they stood him among the pillars, Samson said to the servant who held his hand, put me where I can feel the pillars that support the temple so that I might lean against them. Now the temple was crowded with men and women. All the rulers of the Philistines were there, and on the roof were about 3,000 men and women watching Samson perform. Everyone say, watching. They were watching Samson, who had found himself in the middle of a mess, in the middle of a mistake, in the middle of a situation that he didn't see coming, and he doesn't see a way out of it. And the enemy was watching. And I believe that some of us today, we find ourselves in that same situation. I don't know what it represents for you today, but you're standing here and even in the presence of God, you're thinking about what you've got to face today, what you've got to face tomorrow. It's a situation you didn't see coming. You don't see a way out of it. And you're standing in regret. You're standing in wonder. You're standing in worry. And the enemy's watching you right now, thinking that he's got you trapped. But I've got good news today. What the enemy sees as a trap, God sees as an opportunity for victory, for triumph in your life. If you hold on to him today, he's going to get you there. And so I want you to announce the title of today's sermon. Look at your neighbor. Look at your neighbor. Look at him in the eye and say, neighbor, what you see is what you get. You can be seated. Thank you, worship team. Come on, can we thank the worship team for that time? Y'all are blessed. You're blessed. Phenomenal. 
phenomenal. What you see is what you get. I want to, um, this is my third time here. And uh, so they're going to they're gonna build an office for me in the back. I'm just going to set up shop. <laughs> Amen. Um, no, it's, it's good to be here. And um, I guess, like I said before, anytime you get welcome back, you're like, well, I didn't screw it up too bad the last time. So uh, I'm trusted with this opportunity. But I know I've shown this before, but we just took some recent family photos. I just got to brag on my family because I'm just a proud dad. If we can put um, my family up there on the screen. That's my wife, Jill. Uh, she's on the front row here. Give it up for my wife because we're going on 19 years of marriage next month. 19 years. And uh, these are my four kids, McKenna and Ashton. Ashton has, yes, become taller than me. He's 16, but I still got to show him who's boss every now and then. So when he gets in my face, you know, to show me that he's taller, I just simply grab him and I throw him on the couch because he's not that heavy. He's tall, but he's not that heavy. Uh, my son Ashton's 16. My daughter McKenna, she's about to turn 18, and she's filling out college applications. I can't believe it. Um, you know, but they try to do their best to to keep me current, even though they criticize me in my quest to be current. You know, everything I try to say and do like them, they just like that. It'll never be good enough. You'll never measure up. You know, to our our level. So I try, but uh, they uh, they do their best to, to try to keep me current with what's happening uh, in culture. Um, my my daughter Adeline, she um, she just turned 14. We've always called Addie our Sour Patch Kid, cause she's real sweet, but she's sour too, and she will tear your head off if you cross her the wrong way. I love it, cause I'm like God's gonna use that one day. He's gonna use that strong will, but I'm like right now, girl, remember I'm in charge. You gotta listen to me. Amen. We got some parents empathizing. Yep, we'll have a prayer line afterwards to to pray for all the parents that just are trying to. Gain control of the house. Um, Addie's 14, and uh, yeah, she's full of life. She's social, all that stuff. And she, you know, they all love Jesus, so I'm, I'm just thankful for that. Um, there's a lot that we can't control, you know, when it comes to what they're being influenced by sometimes. But we got to believe that as we train up a child in the way they should go, the Word promises they will not depart from it. And uh, my wife, the other day, she just she was cleaning up, and she came across um, something that my oldest daughter had written down. It was like a favorites list. She just written down a list of favorites, and on there was, was the Word of God. And when I see that, I'm like, oh, thank you, God. I'm doing something right. I'm, I'm doing something right. Thank you, God, for your faithfulness. Um, my, my youngest son there is Jude. He's 10 years old, and uh, we, we always would call Jude our passionate child because we thought that was a spiritual way just to say he's crazy. Uh, he just, he's living life at 100 miles an hour. And just to kind of give you a window into how Jude thinks, um, we were, him and I were sitting on the couch one time, we were watching a movie. It was a sad movie. It was an animated Pixar movie. And, you know, they're always sad. They always got some emotional bent to them. And um, we're watching this movie, and I, I look over at Jude, and his eyes look like they're starting to tear up. At the time, I think he was like five. So I'm like, oh my goodness, my, my son's about to cry. So now I feel myself getting emotional and the tears starting to well up. So I'm like, we're about to have this moment on the couch where we're just going to weep together, me and my passionate child. So I put my arm around him. I'm just getting ready, you know, for this moment that we're going to have. And, and just about the time where the tears are going to roll down my face, Jude perks up and he looks at me and he goes, hey, dad, you want to wrestle after this? I'm like, okay. Just completely broke the emotional moment. And that's kind of a window into how he's thinking constantly, like on to the next thing and living life 100 miles an hour. And that was a moment that I just, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> I didn't see that coming. And I wonder today how many of us, we find ourselves in a moment, in a situation, presently in life where I didn't see that coming. Feel blindsided, feel caught off guard. Something has taken place, maybe, maybe because of someone else's decisions in our life or maybe because of a decision that we've made, and we didn't see this coming, and I don't see a way out. And this is where we find Samson, if we want to pick back up with Samson in Judges 16. Samson was known as the strong man in the Bible. When, God, when the Spirit of God would come upon him, the Bible says that he would have this immense strength, the type of strength where he could kill 2,000 Philistines with nothing but the jawbone of a donkey. He could rip the gates off a city wall and carry them over 30 miles on his back. 
uphill. Immense strength that only came from the Spirit of God. God had gifted him with this strength. God had gifted him with this strength to deliver his people from the hand of the Philistines. But now Samson finds himself in a mess and he's been captured by the very people that God has called him to conquer. He's in a Philistine temple. He's been arrested and they're mocking Samson and they're making sport of him. He's their entertainment for the evening. Strong, mighty Samson has lost his strength. Where did it go? What happened to his strength? Normally, Samson could get himself out of these situations, but not this time. He had lost his strength. You see, Samson didn't really have a strength problem in this moment, but really all of his life, he dealt with a sight problem. And I'm not talking about physically. Spiritually, Samson had taken his eyes off the one who had given him that gift in the first place. And Samson began to use that gift to serve himself rather than serve the people that God had called him to lead. He becomes selfish, he becomes self-centered, and he was using that gift to serve himself. He had a sight problem. He had taken his eyes off the one who had given him that gift. And now he finds himself captive in the place that he had been called to conquer. I wonder how many of us today, we feel captive in the places that God has called us to be conquerors, more than conquerors, is what he says. Maybe, maybe in your work, maybe in your career today, you feel captive. Maybe you had that idea, or maybe you started that business, or just that place of employment. It's just not going the way you had anticipated. Someone walked out on you, someone that they were supposed to be by your side and, and working on this together. You, 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 feel, you feel like it, it's, it's all just falling apart. You feel captive in the place that you really believe that God had called you to conquer. And you're going, how did I get here? I didn't see this coming and I don't see a way through it. I don't see a way out. Maybe in your marriage today, you feel like you're failing as a spouse. You feel captive in your marriage. You felt like a conqueror at that altar, saying those vows, the photography's going, you're eating the cake, the friends and the family are there, everything's good. You go on the honeymoon and now it's just, it's not what I anticipated. And I feel captive in the place that I thought I was going to conquer. Maybe, maybe it's in your identity today. You put on a good front on the surface. People see you one way, but inside you're full of shame. You're full of failure. You're full of fear. You're full of anxiety. And you're worried people are going to find out. They're going to discover what's really going on. And you won't be accepted and you'll be alone. And you feel captive in your own thoughts. You feel captive where you thought God had called you to conquer. That's where we find Samson. He's captive to the people God had called him to conquer. What you see is what you get. He had taken his eyes off the one that could get him through this. You know, I'm talking about Samson, but I also want to talk about this couple that my wife and I know very well. And the husband found himself in a similar situation. The husband was frustrated with where he was in life. This is about 15 years ago. He was frustrated with where he was in life and his career. He thought he would be further along than he was supposed to be. Things weren't turning out the way he had anticipated. And so he got reckless and he made a mistake and he broke a vow to his wife. He pursued another woman. And now he realizes what he's done and he knows he has to tell his wife, but he can't find the strength to do it because he's thinking to himself, how am I going to look my wife in the eyes? The one that I made a promise to, the one that we stood before God and before people and we made a vow to each other. I made a vow to her. How am I going to look at her in the eyes and tell her what I've done, knowing it's going to completely crush her and her whole world is going to come crashing down. He told me that the day he knew he was going to talk to his wife and tell her what he had done. He said, I spent the whole day with my kids. And just thought to myself, am I ever going to see my kids again? Because of what I've done, is my wife going to be so hurt and so devastated, she's going to take the kids and leave, and I'll never see them again. What do we do when we find ourselves in a situation we didn't see coming, and we don't see a way through it, we don't see a way out, and we feel captive? You know, so often in my life, I can tend to focus 
on the what rather than who. I can tend to focus on the something rather than there's someone. I can tend to focus on how rather than it's him and him alone. And I wonder today if we stop focusing on what's before us and this structure that stands against us. And we said, hey, God, instead of what I see today, because what you see is what you get. Instead of God, what I see today, God, what do you see in my situation? And what's going on right now? God, how do you see my life right now? I believe that God would say to you today, I see the possibility over the problem. God sees the possibility over the problem in your situation today. You know, I asked the wife of this couple, I said, how did you find the strength to get out of bed the next day? after everything had come crashing down, after you found yourself in this, in this place of, how do I get through this? You felt captive. So how did you find the strength to wake up the next day and to go about your day and to face it? And this is what she told me. You gotta get this. This is, this is so powerful. She said, I had to see myself laughing with my husband again. So I had to see it. Even though it wasn't before me presently, she said, I had to see it. I had to see myself laughing with him again. I had to see myself enjoying our marriage. I had to see myself forgiving him. I had to see myself letting him off the hook because the vision within is so much greater than the vision without. You'll never experience the victory out here until you you declare it and you believe it in here. You've got to see the possibility over the problem. And some of you, you've got to see yourself. You've got to see yourself free from that addiction, that addiction that's had you bound for too long. You've got to start seeing yourself walking in freedom and knowing that God can use that to bring hope and deliverance to other people that are bound by addiction. You've got to see that loved one that you've been praying for God, please bring them home. God, get a hold. God, chase them down. Let them experience your love. You've got to see as though that loved one is sitting with you right next to you in church. It's not going to be long before that seat's not going to be empty next to you. And they're going to be coming with you to church. You've got to see it in here. You've got to see yourself healed. Healed from that sickness. Healed from that infirmity. You don't need to walk in that. You've got to see yourself and believe it. See the possibility over the problem. She said, I had to see myself laughing with my husband again. And so here we have Samson. He's standing in this temple. The Philistines are mocking him. They're laughing at him. We got him. We won. He's standing there. And oh yeah, what you see is what you get. Samson physically couldn't see. As he's standing there a captive, as he's standing there a prisoner, he physically couldn't see because scripture says how when he was captured by the Philistines, they gouged out his eyes. They took his two eyes. So he physically couldn't see anything. But even though Samson had lost his physical sight, he was so full of vision in this moment because he realized something. Because I guarantee you, this, this wasn't Samson's first time in Gaza, okay? Okay. He had been to Gaza before with other motives. And so I guarantee you at some point, he was walking through Gaza. He took a peek inside that temple and he saw, oh, there's two pillars that hold up the entire structure. And now here he is in this temple. And even though he couldn't see it, oh yeah, he could see it. And he's thinking to himself, if I could get to the pillars, if I could just get to the pillars, Maybe, just maybe, God would strengthen me one more time to push down this structure and defeat everyone inside, accomplishing his purpose one more time that he's called me to. So he's got the vision. He sees the possibility. The problem is, again, he can't see physically. He can't get there by himself. And so here we have a picture of mighty, strong, heroic Samson in Judges 16 Verse 26, 
Samson said to the servant who held his hand, put me where I can feel the pillars that support the temple. Strong, heroic, mighty Samson asking a servant boy, can you help me? Can you, can you just guide me a little bit? I, I know where I need to go, but I can't get there by myself. And how many of us today, we're trying to get to the pillars. We're trying to get to the promise of God. We're trying to fulfill his purpose for our life. We're trying to do it all by ourselves. I know where I need to get to, but I can't do it alone. Why do you think God has given us a place like this to just come in once a, once a week and sing songs and hear someone preach and then go home and then we go about our week like nothing's changed? Why do you think God has given us a place like this? Why do you think he established his church? Why did, you, why did he send his son to die for this place, for you, for me, for his church? Because he knew you can't do this by yourself. You can't get to where you need to go, where I've called you to be. You can't get there by yourself. In your situation today, God sees humility over heroics. So many of us, we're trying to be the hero in our story. We're trying to be the hero. We're just going to get through this, and I don't need anybody. I don't need anyone else. I can do this by myself. No, you can't. That's not how God intended it. That's why he established his church here on earth so that you would humble yourself just like Samson and say, hey, could you help me? Could you show me? Show me where I need to go. Show me how to get there. I can't do this alone. God sees humility over heroics today. This couple that I've been telling you about, I asked them, I said, how did you guys get here? Like what brought you? What do you think brought you to this point of this situation? The husband said, you know, I grew up most of my life a pretty prideful person, pretty judgmental, pretty arrogant, never thought I needed help. In fact, he and his wife, they never went to premarital counseling, never invited anybody in to the process and into the journey. Just thought we've got love and love is all you need and, and we'll be fine. He said, even after I had made that mistake and we're trying to get through this situation, he's like, we weren't getting through it together. He said, because so often the help would come and the advice and the counseling and, and everything would come my way. He's like, but I would, I would defend myself. I would put up a wall. I would, I would throw out excuses. I would make a case as to why I was justified in my actions and yet nothing was getting better. The help was there, but it wasn't getting better. The marriage wasn't healing. He says, it wasn't until I humbled myself and shut up, <laughs> practice James 1.19, be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. He's like, once I finally humbled myself, then my marriage could start to heal. The wife told me that when this took place, she said, I realized something about myself. I realized that all of my hope, all of my faith, all of my dependence was in my husband. She says, it wasn't until I put all of my trust, all of my faith in my heavenly father, then I could finally start to fight for my marriage because my hope was in him. God sees humility over heroics. You know, being a father of four, so often I've tried to figure out this father thing by myself. I've tried to do it alone. And so often I've, I've been the one apologizing to my kids more than they apologize to me. I'm trying to figure this out. I'll give you an example of, of just how off I was in my parenting skills. I'm, I'm the type of father where it's like I have this gift where I can see disaster before it happens. Like my kids are goofing around, you know, Ashton one time in particular, he was younger and he's like goofing around. And I'm like, I'm telling you, boy, you're on the couch and there's the coffee table. And all I can see is your head colliding with the corner of that coffee table. If you don't settle down, you don't slow down, it's going to be bad. And sure enough, something happens and he gets hurt and he's laying on the ground and he's crying and he's bloody. And you would think as a merciful, loving father, I would come down to him and I would get on his level. and I would scoop him up and assure him that everything's going to be okay. No. That's not what I did. I had to prove a point in that moment. As my son is hurting, as he's bloody, I'm standing over him going, I told you, I told you. 
You wouldn't listen to me. And now look at you lying on the ground, crying, bloody, afraid, ashamed. And this is my son's reaction. In the moment, he looks at me and he says, please don't call the cops. I said, oh, I didn't see that coming. (laughs) Am I coming across that abrasive that my son thinks I'm going to turn him in because he got hurt? How backwards is this? trying to figure out this parenting thing all by myself, trying to be the hero, trying to be the know-it-all. God sees in your situation today, he sees humility over heroics. You know, this, this husband, he told me, he's like, I know who I needed to talk to when everything had gone down. He's like, I know I needed to go to my father. I know I needed to talk to him and ask him for help. What do I do? Where do I start? He said, that's the last person I wanted to go to. He said, because he always looked to his father as his hero. Because his father had set a good example on how to be a faithful husband, a loving father. He's like, the last person you want to go to for help when you've done something humiliating and shameful, the last person you want to go to is your hero. But he humbled himself and he asked for help. And his father told him this, And in regards to your situation today, maybe you're worried about just everything, everything you've worked so hard for, everything that you've done to achieve. His father said, you know, son, in your marriage, you're going to tell your wife and everything might come crashing down. It probably will. He said, but maybe that's exactly what needs to happen in your marriage so that God can take the broken pieces of your marriage and start to rebuild your marriage Piece by piece by piece by piece. It's a marriage that is built on his purposes. It's a marriage that's built on his foundations. It's a life that's built according to his ways and not our own. Maybe that's exactly what needs to happen if you humble yourself. God sees the possibility over the problem. He sees humility over heroics. And so here we have Samson. He's between the pillars. He's exactly where God wants him in this situation. He's exactly where he needs to be because he saw the possibility. He humbled himself. He asked for help. And now he's positioned exactly where he needs to be. And I got to believe for some of us today that God's got you exactly where he wants you today. It still might seem overwhelming. Samson has this whole temple thousands of people upon him. It seems big. It seems overwhelming. And you're thinking, how am I going to get strong enough to get through this? God, I know you, I know that you're with me, but, but I need the strength, God, to push through this situation now. Samson couldn't focus on getting strong in this moment, even though he was exactly where he needed to be. He knew, I just need a little bit of strength to, to try to push through this, but he couldn't focus on strength. All he could do in that moment was completely surrender. Just surrender it. Surrender it. He says in Judges 16, 28, Samson prayed to the Lord, sovereign Lord. I love how he says sovereign Lord. So often the way that we come to God is based on the way we view him, the way we perceive him. Do you perceive him as a father or do you perceive him as a foe? Someone just waiting for you to screw up so he can smite you down. How do you perceive your heavenly father today? Samson said, sovereign Lord, not just Lord, sovereign Lord. Sovereign means to be over everything, almighty, all powerful. Lord, I know that this situation is big. It's vast. It's grand. But Lord, you're over it. You're greater than it. So sovereign Lord, he cries out, sovereign Lord, remember me. Remember me, please God, strengthen me just once more and let me with one blow get revenge on the Philistines for my two eyes. He has to surrender everything in that moment. See, because in your situation today, God sees surrender over strength. That's what he sees. What you see is what you get. He sees surrender over 
strength. And we know the story. If you don't, let me tell you, God strengthens Samson one more time. He gives him the strength he needs. And the Bible says how he, he braced himself against the pillars. And I even love the visual of Samson bracing himself because it says how he placed his right hand on one and his left hand on the other. He braced himself. He, he's surrendering in this moment. And it says he pushed with all of his might. He pushed through the pillars and the temple came towering down, killing everyone inside, even Samson. And it's the proof that God did more through Samson when he was willing to give it all than when he was trying to get it all. Are you willing to give it all today? I asked the wife, I said, tell me more about this process. Tell me more about this journey. How, how did you get to a place where you saw God begin to work in your marriage? She said it was tough because every day she said, I would wake up and I was hurt and I was worried. She said, I was hurt because of what my husband had done. She said, I was worried that he would do it again. And so the Holy Spirit convicted her and said, child, daughter, just give your husband to me. Give the situation to me today. Maybe you're not facing a, a marriage issue. Like I said earlier, I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what structure of shame or guilt or fear is standing over you today. And I know you feel paralyzed in it, standing between the two pillars. I always feel like the pillars for me represent the regret of my past and the uncertainty of my future. And I'm right in the middle. What have I done? What am I gonna do? And I'm in this place where I can't change the past. I can't control the future. God, all I can do is give it all to you. Surrender every part of it to you. God sees surrender over strength. And there's, there's another moment in scripture in Luke 23 where Jesus, he's hanging on a cross. He's between two thieves. He's in the middle of it. He's between two thieves. And the one thief cries out. He says, Jesus, will you remember me? What does Samson say? Sovereign Lord, remember me. This thief looks at Jesus and said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. What did Jesus say? He says, truly today, today, you will be with me and I will be with you in paradise. It's the proof that if you'll surrender in the presence of God, he's not gonna say, well, someday or when you get yourself right or when you get yourself cleaned up, he says, no, today I'll meet you exactly where you are. What you see is what you get. So it's just up to us to stand in God's presence in full surrender and say, God, what you see is what you get. <laughs> in my brokenness, my shame and my faults and in my failures in my mistakes in my gifts and my talents and my abilities God everything everything God I give it to you I give it to you I fully surrender it this will work church this will work I'm not giving you a formula today it's a daily decision to deny yourself to pick up your cross and to follow Jesus. Seeing the possibility, even though the problem is so great, God, I know that you're more than enough, that all things are possible through you. I'm gonna humble myself. Stop trying to be the hero and I'm gonna surrender. Stop trying to get strong in this moment. It'll work. It has to work. You know why I believe it'll work? Because I've seen it work. What you see is what you get. I've seen it work. This couple I've been telling you about, they're still married to this day. God is using their story to bring hope and to bring glory and honor to his name. So that whatever it is you're going through today, you know there is a way. Whatever you feel trapped in or stuck in today, you can believe 
God, you'll make a way. Can I show you a picture of the family I've been talking about? on your faithfulness while we were yet sinners you gave everything when we didn't deserve it you showed that unconditional sacrificial love so God we give everything to you today we humble ourselves. we choose to see the possibility we believe we believe that you can work that you are working in our life look at me real quick you can put your hands down can I give you some bonus material real fast, real fast? I didn't have this plan and I'm, I'm going a little over time, I'm sorry, but I just have to show you something so amazing. So amazing. How important it is to spend time in the presence of God. How important it is to prioritize time with Him and just dwell and just remain and just abide in His presence. Look at this, look at this. So Samson, he was in a Philistine temple God that the Philistines worshiped was Dagon, Dagon, okay? And just like that, the presence of God entered that temple and strengthened Samson to defeat the enemy of God. If we go a little bit ahead in 1 Samuel chapter five, totally different situation. The Philistines had stolen the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant represented the presence of God. Let me read it for you, just so you know, this is real. After the Philistines had captured the Ark of the Covenant, this is 1 Samuel 5, after they had captured the Ark of God, they took it to Ashdod. They carried the Ark into Dagon's temple, the temple that Samson had been standing in, Dagon's temple, and set it beside Dagon. When the people of Ashdod rose the next day, there was Dagon fallen on his face, on the ground before the ark of the Lord. They took Dagon, they put him back up in his place. But the following morning when they rose, there was Dagon again, fallen on his face on the ground before the ark, before the presence of the Lord. And his head and his hands had been broken off and were lying on the ground. It's just the proof, authentic church, that darkness, that the plan of the enemy, it cannot stand in the presence of God. All it requires of us is the people of God is to simply surrender in his presence. And I love that picture that the head and the hands of their God had broken off. The head, everything we think about, all the thoughts that keep us up at night, all the thoughts that just keep us pondering and twirling and fearing and wondering, God, how's it going to work out? And the hands, everything we try to control, everything we try to do in our power, if we'll just give it to him today. The plan of the enemy has to come down. It has to fall in the presence of God. So one more time, lift your hands in this place as an act of surrender. Oh, the overwhelming presence, love, the matchless love of God. God, we thank you that it chased us down. It captured us. It brought us to this place. So God, we give you all. We give you everything knowing that you are for us. God, if you are for us, who and what can be 
nothing against us, no structure of shame, no structure of guilt, no structure of condemnation. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So we surrender our lives to you, knowing it's not by might nor by power, but by your spirit, God, says the Lord. Come on, give it. Hey guys, this is Pastor Bobby Chandler, and I just want to say thank you so much for watching today's message. We pray that it blessed your life, but do me a favor, before you just click off of YouTube, make sure you subscribe to our channel, and also ring that bell so that you get notifications on the next sermon or any announcements that we have going on. I also want to say thank you for being a faithful partner with Authentic Church, because of your giving, we are able to bless and impact the people around us every single week. So, we love our Authentic family. Family, and thank you today for joining us.